How is everybody today? Well, my name is Eric Husby, and I'm the acting legal director uh, since Edwin Kagan passed away, um, unfortunately. Uh, I was previously the deputy national legal director, working with Edwin on various legal matters for several years. I knew Edwin for quite a while, many years, first as an outside counsel, doing work on uh, cases locally in Florida, and um, uh, then uh, became more involved uh, through his mentorship, and I uh, really enjoyed working with Edwin. It was sad when he passed away, and um, while I don't want to redo the memorial, I did want to say a word in his uh, honor, and I feel really honored today to be speaking uh, in his place, although I could never fill his shoes. Um, I think the only thing I can do is what he would want all of us to do, which is take the baton uh, and run with it, and I think he would probably more characterize it as uh, pick up the weapon and continue waging the war, because that's what we are, uh, are doing and what Edwin always, uh, always made sure to remind us of. And um, I have to say, uh, I wish the circumstances were different. I, I did really care for Ed when I was shocked at, at his passing. Um, we were very much different people. I'm a northern New Jersey uh, born and bred uh, uh, northerner. He's a Kentuckyite, um, obviously, a very smart individual, and also uh, a lot of, uh, lot of hillbilly uh, there. Um, we did share one thing in common, and, uh, and uh, it seemed to be that um, Many people would like to joke about our verbosity, uh, respectively. And uh, what I thought was funny is that in almost every conversation with Edwin, he would, uh, he would say, Eric, 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 take a breath, take a breath. Let me get a word in edgewise. Now, anybody that knows Edwin would find that highly, highly ironic that Edwin is asking someone else to let him get a word in edgewise, because normally uh, he's the only one uh, that, uh, that Edwin would, would uh, allow to speak. So um, we, I always thought that was funny and uh, it will be something I always remember him, uh, remember about him, along with many, many other things which I don't have time to get into here. Um, without further ado, once again, good afternoon everybody. My name is Eric Husby and I too am an atheist. But as long as I am uh, admitting to things that uh, in polite company used to be uh, very difficult to admit. Let me also come out today as an attorney. And, uh, and I know, I know, I know that... Uh, <laughs> just hear me out. Just hear me out, please. Uh, the, uh, uh, I've been practicing for 20 years. Let me see if this works. We'll see. It's not working. There we go. Now it's working. That's me, that's my hometown now, my adopted hometown of Tampa, Florida. Uh, that's my contact information, my name, uh, anyone's able, to, I hope that you'll all, uh, that I'll get a chance to meet you all uh, after the, the talk and during the festivities later on and tomorrow. If not, if there's questions you have on legal issues that I can't, don't answer today during this talk or afterwards, feel free to contact me anytime. Um, that you have something come up or, of course, through the contact information at American Atheists, which um, I'm going to encourage you more than once today to, uh, to use when you have a legal issue that arises. Um, I welcome any questions, as I said, at any time. I've been practicing for 20 years. I've practiced in Florida, New Jersey, and Michigan, and, um, and I'm licensed in those three states. And um, 20 years, that uh, just always stops me in my tracks because I, I feel like it's just yesterday that I passed the bar and it's 20 years later this year. So there we have it. Um, next item by way of background, I had to sneak in a little bit of, uh, of who I do everything for, which is my beautiful wife, Juliana, who's here, and my uh, beautiful new daughter, Sophia. Uh, she's not here, but I will uh, be, I am happy to report that she is yet another uh, uh, person who was born an atheist. So a big round of applause for my little girl. And um, I'm sure from what my wife tells me, taking care of her all day long, she says, she, like you, Eric, she never shuts up. So I think we probably have, um, if not a lawyer, then a similar profession in about another 25 years or so. 
Um, again, I, I reside in Tampa, Florida, um, and anybody at, that, that is in the neighborhood, I hope you'll look me up. Now, the title of this talk is Our Battles in the War for Equality and Liberty. And a lot of people don't like the use of the uh, more aggressive terms, uh, battle and war, but uh, in my opinion and in Edwin's opinion, the, this, this, these are battles because this really is a war. And I want to point out that it's not the silly war that we're accused of being involved in, which is the fictional war on Christmas that we're all supposed to be uh, waging. But what we're involved in and what all these cases I'm going to update you about are about is our fight in, uh, for our core principles and our core rights as human beings in the United States. That's why this is important. That's why all the cases, large and small, are important. Uh, human dignity, individual rights, freedom of belief, equal treatment under the law, and the right to be let alone, another word for liberty, is what we fight for and is at the core, you'll see it at the core of every case that we bring because that is what the opposition looks to take from us. That's what the religious people, a well-funded or array of groups that are well-funded and well-organized these days with the backing of groups like the Liberty Council and the American Center for Law and Justice, they uh, offer to use their forces and their uh, money to defend local governments in infringing on our rights and, and uh, as an affront to our human dignity. So that's, I want to stress that as the importance of, of what we're fighting for and why this is a war and why we are engaged in the American religious civil war, which is a term that Edwin uh, coined. Now, to that end, since the founding of American Atheists, uh, it has been the legal mission of American atheists to do certain things. And I say legal mission because there are many purposes that a, a, a nonprofit organization is founded for. But from the legal point of view, we fight for the civil liberties of atheists. You'll see that on the, on the American Atheist website. We fight for the absolute separation of government and religion, also known as church and state. We advanced our First Amendment rights and civil rights. And American Atheist Inc. was created. Many of the younger folks might not know uh, how American Atheist was created, but you should look it up if you don't know. And it arose out of, uh, out of the, one of the foremost legal battles in the history of the United States, Murray versus Curlot, which is um, uh, joined with another case called Shemp, the Shemp case, um, before the US Supreme Court, both of which involved uh, prayer in the public schools. And um, uh, our founding member, Madeleine Murray O'Hare, uh, removed compulsory prayer from the public schools with this long legal battle from the late 50s to almost the mid 60s. And uh, yes, a round of applause to us and to her. And the reason why I, I bring this up is because that's the first and probably the greatest salvo in the, the war against the opposition that I mentioned before to protect our core dignity as human beings because compulsory prayer in public schools was an affront to the dignity of every American, including those who agreed with the religion that was being preached at the time. So I, I, I hope you'll all look into that a little further. If you're not already aware of it, most of you probably are. Now for the legal update. I don't have a lot of time today, but um, the um, I want to go through some of the cases to make sure I hit them all that we're uh, working on as part of uh, the same mission that Madeline Murray O'Hare created this organization to achieve. Now, the great victory of the last year was a case called American Atheist versus Bradford County, Florida, and I, er I, I er hope you're all aware of it. This is a picture of what we were fighting against in that case. In Bradford County, Florida, which is in north central Florida, a town called Stark, they erected this six-ton monument uh, uh, to the Ten Commandments. It's a, a group called the Community Men's Fellowship, Inc., along with other Christian groups that are actually engaged in this common plan and scheme to go across the United States to various towns and erect similar monuments. This was not the first one. The ACLU did battle against this very same monument, virtually the same monument, in Dixie County, Florida. They won, then they ultimately had their uh, case reversed on, on strange grounds, on standing grounds, legal technicality issues, and then they walked away, walked away from the suit. I'm sorry about that. They walked away from that suit. 
So that monument in Dixie County still stands. This monument in Bradford County still stands, but why is this a, a seminal victory in the history of the, uh, uh, of the organization and one that we should be very, very proud of? Well, the next slide will tell us. This is the victory for equality, one of the core uh, rights that we fight for in all of our cases. We did not get uh, the removal of the Ten Commandments in this case, but what we did get is our own uh, I believe one ton monument. It's a very heavy granite monument and off to the right you'll, uh, of the monument where you see our plaintiff, Daniel Cooney, sitting on the monument in the picture to the left, um, there is the Ten Commandments monument. This is perched about five feet away from the, the, the Ten Commandments monument and contains quotes from Madeline Murray O'Hare, uh, Thomas Jefferson, and other, uh, uh, the, the Treaty of Tripoli, and various other quotes that we admire. And, a, and the image of American atheists. And this is the first monument to atheism and non-belief that has ever been placed on public ground in the United States. And we achieved that last year. And that's thanks very much to everyone. And it's, th it's thanks very much also to the man sitting on the monument to the right, which is David Silverman, you all know. And he, he and Edwin and I worked very closely together on this case throughout it. And, um, and achieve this result via a settlement with the county of Bradford. Now, I always like to quote by uh, Yogi Berra, it's deja vu all over again. And I told you these, there was a common plan here for these monuments to go up. Look at that monument, look familiar, it's Bradford County again, it's Dixie County again in Levy County, Florida, which is near Ocala. Now, Levy County, Florida, uh, put this monument up a while back and we took a different tact. We didn't go to court right away because litigation costs money and litigation is hard and litigation bears the risk of loss, etc. So we tried a different tact and we've applied with a local group in, in uh, Levy County for our own monument. Uh, that application was filed back in January or February and initially the county of Levy denied that application. Now it's interesting, one of the main reasons, I won't go through the whole litany uh, of reasons why they denied that monument, but our, our monument, which would be a, another bench, the Levy County um, essentially said that the main reason they would not allow our monument is because we did not include complete texts from which we were drawing our quotes. For example, if we have the Treaty of Tripoli, the quote in the beginning that says, uh, this nation is, found, is not, in no sense founded upon the Christian religion. You're all familiar with that treaty from 1797, which says the United States is in no sense founded on the Christian religion. They say that quote is not appropriate for a monument because we don't include the entire text of the Treaty of Tripoli on the monument from beginning to end. Now, I don't know if you've looked closely at the monument that, uh, of the Ten Commandments, but that does not contain a single quote from the Bible. It contains only a list of small paraphrases. Paraphrases, and everybody who went to, to uh, college knows what a, or high school knows what a paraphrase is compared to a quote. A paraphrase is not a quote, not even a quote, to use that phrase. So we appealed through the, uh, the, the administrative systems at the Levy County with an appeal, and we included uh, in that an explanation. We said, hey guys, your monument doesn't contain quotes, let alone complete quotes. If you were to contain the complete quotes, you'd at least have to have the entire chapter of Exodus 34 or whatever, whichever one they're using, uh, Deuteronomy, whatever, if not the entire Bible. What's the entire uh, quote? And what, the only response that we've received literally is, well, the Ten Commandments are special. <laughs> they have a special place under U.S. law, according to them. So. We are 99% certain that our appeal in Levy County is going to be denied. And that's by denied, I mean denied by Levy County itself. It's not in court. So uh, stay tuned. Uh, we may be filing suit uh, before too long in Levy County to, to get that monument removed in this case will be number one. Secondarily, we would like our own monument. If we're not going to be able to get it removed, we of course want our monument side by side in a comparably prominent position. So. Um, that is work in process, and we are confident it will, next year we would hopefully be able to report either that monument being gone or our monument standing side by side. Now what's next? 
Ten Commandments is rearing its ugly head again. This is another work in process. Uh, American Atheist versus Thompson. Thompson is a member of the Oklahoma uh, Capital Preservation Commission. And that's a commission that is in charge of putting artwork up uh, in the uh, capital in Oklahoma City for the state of Oklahoma. Now, they put this monument, which you can see a corner of. I chose this photo because it shows the capital right in the background to give you a sense of the prominent position they place this monument. Now, if you saw this from a distance, you would see there isn't anything else next to this monument. They have not tried to create a panoply of monuments uh, to honor various documents like the Code of Hammurabi and various other important legal documents from the history of mankind. They have placed this in, a, in the front of their capital so people going in and out pass by it and see it in a position of honor. So what we did was we brought suit and we have a case in the United States District Court for the I believe, Western District of uh, Oklahoma. and. Um, that is uh, underway as we speak. Um, we don't know for sure what's going to happen. We're very confident that the result will be in our favor. However, courts have upheld these monuments in the past and, uh, and, and nothing is guaranteed. But in this particular case, the, the, the feature that most intrigues us is that this was a gentleman by the name of Dr. Mike Rizzi, who is a uh, state representative in Oklahoma, who spearheaded this and, fund, and funded this through an organization and uh, to make it look ostensibly as if it's private, private funds. And they created a statute in uh, Oklahoma, a law, which says, you will put up a Ten Commandments monument in front of our state capitol. And they did not say, you will put up a monument park or you will put up other monuments, an array of monuments to be fair, to be equal to various belief systems and other religions. They said only a Ten Commandment monument. So where we believe that that itself constitutes a violation uh, an establishment of religion, and we've, while the lawsuit is more complicated than, than, than just that, that's the focal point. It's an establishment of religion, and at a bare minimum, it denies us also of equal protection of the laws because it does not uh, mention a single other document, religious or otherwise, besides the Ten Commandments in that law. So again, stay tuned. We hope to bring you good news next year um, when you attend the conference that this monument has a bag over it or has been removed. Uh, and, I, and I say bag over it, not, not even to be funny. That's happened before. There was a cross in, uh, we weren't involved in the lawsuit, but if, if, this, if anybody's aware of the Mount Soledad cross uh, out west, that had a big box over it for a long period of time. So uh, it's, a, it's, a, it's an avenue we've considered in, in this case and, and potentially in others like Levy to ask the court to say, in the meantime, put a bag over it. So uh, it's, there are reasons why we don't necessarily do that, but we may, well, uh, we may well do it in the appropriate case. Now, there, this is not, again, this is, I want everybody to keep a lookout for um, Ten Commandments monuments in your towns. And I'll tell you a little why we need you to look in your own towns and your own backyards for these things be, uh, a little bit later. But here's some other places. I'm working with uh, uh, Ed Buckner, uh, in this, uh, in Georgia, because he discovered in his backyard there isn't a monument up yet, but there's a statute that's been passed in uh, in Georgia to create a Ten Commandments monument at the state capitol in Georgia. Yet another monument. These things are cropping up like pimples, and uh, and he is helping me to gain initial uh, uh, documentation from the state. And um, again, this is work in process. We have not commenced litigation yet, but it, it is uh, something we believe we're going to have to do if we cannot resolve it informally um, before, before here. Bloomfield, New Mexico has one at their city hall. Connellsville, Pennsylvania has it at a junior high school. Sandpoint, Idaho has one in a public park. It's been there for a while. They had a debate recently to say whether they should remove it. And of course, the, the majority there is holding, we need to defend this monument on public grounds. So. Uh, stay tuned there as well. There are other organizations that, that, that are watching out for this as well, and um, we try not to repeat business, but um, we are keeping an eye on all these places to see if these are areas where we'll, we'll pursue. Montgomery, Alabama, which will come up again later in my talk, will, is, uh, has one at their state judicial building as well. And, uh, and they are, they're, they're, too, they're coming up too quick to count. 
So again, we want you to look out for these things and report them to my office or to directly to American Atheists uh, through the information line because you need to, um, to get these things on the radar um, so that we can take action against them. Now, another case that we have ongoing is a wonderful case uh, called American Atheist versus Port Authority of New York and New Jersey. Many of you are aware of that, thank you. This case involves that uh, artifact um, there, which is the, which is, a, looks like a cross, but it's really an I-beam uh, from the uh, World Trade Center, which was erected at the World Trade Center site shortly after the uh, towers went down on that fateful day. Now, every one of us here uh, that was old enough to, um, to pass the age of reason at the time still feels a pang of, uh, of sadness at that particular day. Um, and I don't think anyone would, would really begrudge anyone uh, their own symbol on private property that gives them cons consolation uh, uh, of whatever, whatever means. And that's where it was initially. Initially, it was uh, at the, the World Trade Center site, which was a private building at the time. Um, and then it was moved to a church, uh, which was a private building. And it stayed at the church for several years. However, then, uh, Father Brian Jordan and some other individuals uh, in the religious community got together with state officials and Port Authority officials, which is a government agency in New York and New Jersey, and they moved the monument, moved the, 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 the crossbeam to the 9-11 uh, memorial and museum. And they took the position that we're just put it, this is just uh, a museum piece, like a, uh, like a 8th century uh, Anglo-Saxon cross in uh, the, the Metropolitan Museum of Art. Um, we took issue with this uh, quite some time ago, um, and Edwin spearheaded the case uh, through the district court in the Southern District of New York, and we fought hard to remove this, this, uh, this cross, and alternatively, um, if the court was to find that this was a, a, an array of monuments or displays, uh, we were asking for our own monument uh, to be included, to gain equality, first liberty, then equality. Now, uh, we lost, unfortunately, in the district court. The district court ruled uh, in favor of summary judgment for the defendants in the case uh, and said that this monument did not violate the Establishment Clause uh, of the United States Constitution or equal protection. We are on appeal now at the Second Circuit Court of Appeals, and the fight is not over. Uh, shortly before his death, Edwin argued the case uh, before the Second Circuit Court of Appeals in New York, and we fully briefed it, and we hope to have a successful outcome um, in the not too distant future. Uh, so stay tuned as well for the result in the 9-11 cross case. Another very interesting case that is currently ongoing is American Atheists Incorporated versus Commissioner of the IRS. Uh, and, uh, Edwin and I worked for a, a while on this case to prepare it and uh, essentially so everyone is aware what we're suing the IRS for is discrimination under Internal Revenue Code 501c3. That is the same uh, Internal Revenue Code uh, under which the American Atheists is registered as a nonprofit organization. And most organizations will file an application and pay an $850 filing fee and then uh, get on the hook to provide disclosures and information returns on an annual basis, all sorts of, uh, of onerous requirements. But as, uh, as you might expect in this day and age, churches and religious institutions are not treated the same way. Religious groups and churches are presumed to be tax exempt. We're not presumed to be tax exempt. They're presumed to be tax exempt. With limited exemptions, very limited exemptions, churches and religious groups do not have to submit annual uh, information returns. They do not have to file Form uh, 1023 for 501c3 status. They don't have to pay the $850 filing fee. Churches and religious groups are simply treated differently and treated preferentially under the Internal Revenue Code. It even goes so far as IRS audits and reviews. Uh, while the IRS will audit uh, an organization like American Atheists or even other organizations that do, say, public safety, animal safety, child safety, literary, educational, uh, charitable work, they can be audited almost at will by the IRS. Now, what, what has to happen for a church to be audited is that a high-level IRS officer must determine that there is serious and reasonable grounds 
to investigate a church or a religious institution. No such requirement is required to audit the American atheists. It's a clear disparate treatment case, a clear establishment of religion case, in my opinion, and obviously in Edwin's opinion as well, uh, when we filed the case. Um, in fact, churches do not even have to withhold income taxes uh, uh, on wages they pay to their ministers. Whereas the same requirement does not apply. There's other requirements too. We set it forth in our lawsuit. It's a public record. If anybody wants a copy, I can send it to you as well. Now, um, that case has been, full, has been briefed. It is now waiting for a court decision as to whether the case will continue at the district court level. Um, interestingly enough, I received documentation the other day as I'm taking over for, for Edwin um, uh, in that case. I just received documentation that the court is contemplating requiring additional briefing um, from the lawyers of both sides, which is a very interesting development uh, and to me implies that the court is, is thinking hard enough about this that we should be confident that we're going to be allowed to continue to trial on the case. Because a motion to dismiss at an early stage of the lawsuit has to be based on a very simple and clear ground. And so if it requires a lot of thought, it generally implies uh, that the plaintiff has, uh, has good grounds to proceed. So that's very encouraging. Now, we don't know um, what will happen in that case, but again, we should have a result of some kind by next, by next year, by next, uh, uh, next convention. And we hope, uh, we hope to, to emerge victorious. It's no fun ever going up against the IRS. And, um, and there's a lot of risk involved to any organization that does it. So we should all be proud of American Atheists for pulling the trigger and going ahead and including the IRS in, in our work. Okay, I hope I'm not almost done with my time, but I'm going to try to be quick. We also have an ongoing investigation regarding uh, Operation Good Shepherd in um, Montgomery, Alabama, another Alabama incident. This is a program that the police have in Montgomery, Alabama to have ministers, Christian ministers, counsel uh, victims of crime and criminals. During police arrests and inquiries and interviews, they will now have a minister come in and counsel you if you're a victim or you if you are an alleged perpetrator in an attempt to reduce crime. And in the news reports, the police have been quoted brazenly stating that the purpose is to bring Jesus Christ to people that need it for the purpose of reducing crime. Now, a news report, of course, is not the end-all, be-all of a case, but we have, a, we have sent out Freedom of Information Act requests, Open Record Act requests, we're reviewing those, and we are going to uh, most likely, I think, uh, consider pr proceeding against the state of Alabama, the city of Al Montgomery, Alabama, I'm sorry, regarding this uh, this brazen violation of, of church and state. They even quote Psalm 82, 4, where the good shepherd phrase comes from on their, on their material. So um, again, stay tuned for that. Now, uh, that summarizes all current cases that we are involved in, and we're actively pursuing this war. Uh, but there is another thing I wanted to bring to your attention concerning legal issues that are almost never mentioned um, when it comes to normally we're fighting local governments, but all of you have a stake in the liberty and equality interest as well because it's not always known that atheists are protected by anti-discrimination laws in the workplace, in places of public accommodation, the same as race, color, creed, national origin, and religion. So if you are discriminated against in any way, on the job by a private employer or by a private public accommodation, you need to report it to us and let us know because it may be something we can help you with um, and move forward. Similarly, um, another, uh, another issue that has grown in recent years is license plate discrimination. Uh, people want to have vanity plates, and this is a small issue, but a suit was just filed yesterday or the day before in New Jersey by a, uh, by a woman, I can't remember her last name, but she was denied uh, the license plate eight theist, the number eight theist. She was denied by the state of New Jersey because that was considered offensive. So they're calling us offensive by nature, by the mere fact that we uh, call ourselves atheists. And that's wrong, and it's a, maybe license plates are a small matter, but it's an issue that needs to, be, needs to be fought because we need to fight this on all fronts. And it's important to individuals who want 
you know, the word Baptist or Christian is not prohibited on license plates, so why should atheists? Our, our, uh, our uh, leader, uh, David Silverman, I don't know if he's here. Oh, there he is. He, uh, uh, he also had the same problem last year. And, uh, and uh, uh, I believe, uh, I know I talked with David. I may have assisted him with a letter uh, to, uh, to the state of New Jersey to have his atheist license plate uh, approved. Initially, they denied it, claiming that the word atheist was offensive then, too. Um, luckily, and I think it probably had because of the weight of American atheists behind it, they reversed their decision and, and uh, David uh, received his plate without litigation. But we would have sued had it been, had it been necessary. So it's very important. It's a, it's a thing you can bring to our attention and we can help you. So what else can you do? Speak up. Don't take it anymore in your towns. Don't worry about necessarily what's going on across the country per se. I mean, worry about it, but look at what's going on in your town. Are they doing prayers at, at city council meetings? Go to the city council meeting and tell them to stop. Are they putting up a Ten Commandments monument? Go to the city council meeting and tell them to stop if you're part of the citizenry. That's where the law starts. Participate in your local governments. Get on the city council. Stop them from doing it by being on the council. And anyone can do it. You should see in some of these towns that are putting up these monuments, the people that are on these council councils have absolutely no idea what they're doing. They don't even think they're bound by the Constitution. They think that local governments, I mean, after 60, 80 years after it was decided by the Supreme Court that they were, they still aren't aware that they're bound by, by the Constitution. Write to your representatives. Make an Open Records Act request or contact us if you have a problem and you want help. We can help you do it. Petition your government for redress of grievances. This is one of the, this is the second most important thing. We can help you, but often we need your help to help you. There has to be a named plaintiff in most of these lawsuits. There has to be an individual willing to go up and say, I was injured. I, the individual, have to look at this thing. I have to hear this thing. I am discriminated against. If we just simply go as an organization and claim that there's a general injury, we can get thrown out of court for lack of standing, technical grounds. So we need people to stand up who want to petition their government for redress of grievances and file suit and have your name on a pleading. But there's nothing wrong with doing that. Madeleine Murray O'Hare did it 50 years ago when atheists were still not able to vote or hold office in certain states. So um, I think that we should all stand up when we can and, and be a named plaintiff. You'll be honored to do it when it's all done. Lastly, and most importantly, support American atheists financially. All these cases cost a lot of money, filing fees alone, deposition fees alone, local attorney fees if we have to hire them. It's very costly. And all of your donations here and, and everything are, are very much appreciated, but um, there's, there, it, it, the, the opposition, as I mentioned at the beginning, are well-funded and well-organized. The people who are donating money there are donating large sums of money to Liberty Council and to American Center for Law and Justice, and we need we need to, to, to meet them in battle. And that, I think, am I at the end or over time? Over, I'm sorry. Yeah, I, as, I, as I said at the beginning, I was fair disclosure. I, I like to hear the sound of my voice, uh, and, uh, and, and uh, I wouldn't let anybody get a word in edgewise. So again, this is your courage, your cheerfulness, your resolution to help us win these battles, and we hope that we've brought you victories and giving you value for, for your membership dollars and your contributions. And I'm just going to keep Common Lawyer on. Thank you very much.